Welcome to Briz Science, brought to you by the University of Queensland. I am your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. Uh, we're obviously trialling a different format of Briz Science tonight because just like everybody is doing their own science experiments at home now, from microbes in sourdough through to seeing how long you can really go without a haircut, uh, so too are we bringing you our great science and great scientists direct from their homes. Uh, we do ask though that you bear with us if there are any technical difficulties. Uh, it's obviously a new format for us. So um, it will be an opportunity if you have problems along the way, pop it into the Q&A and we'll address that as quickly as we can. Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and the, their custodianship of the many, many lands on which we're meeting today. On behalf of Bridge Science, I'd like to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and also recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So tonight, before we get into the talk, a few bits of housekeeping. First of all, like always, we're going to hear from our speaker first, who I'll introduce in a moment, and then there'll be the opportunity for Q&A. Um, tonight, we'll be taking Q&A over the surprisingly named Q&A button, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So you should be able to type questions in there, and at the end, I'll go through as many of those as I can in the time we have left. Um, we're not taking questions over Twitter tonight, just to keep things simple. Um, but you should obviously feel free to um, contact us there afterwards if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, the session tonight is being recorded, as is the case with all our Brist Science talks, and so will be available on the UQ Science YouTube channel, a great place to catch up on any talk you might have missed and uh, fill in the time at home. Um, but we will, of course, not be broadcasting any of your audience members' names, personal details, etc. You will be anonymous, um, unless you choose not to be in a question for any reason. Um, and after tonight's event, there will be a very short questionnaire that we'd love you to take part in, just so we can get a sense of how this went. Okay, so I think that's all the um, uh, important housekeeping there. Obviously there's no drinks and nibblies provided. This time you'll have to provide those yourself, um, but I'm sure you can be creative. So tonight is all about the one group who actually think that maybe COVID-19 isn't all that bad. I'm of course talking about our dogs, um, bringing here our special guest Spot. Um, the slightly less fun fact is that one in three dogs will develop cancer over their lives. And this presents an opportunity for research that might benefit both dogs and people through cross-pollination. Now this is an emerging and complex field, so here to throw us a bone tonight I'm very excited to introduce Associate Professor Rachel Alavena. Rachel is a veterinary pathologist who specialises in animal diseases. She's also the Deputy Head of School of Vet Science at UQ and, amongst other things, researches cancer treatment for pet dogs through triggering the dog's immune system to fight cancer. So to tell us more, please put your virtual hands together and welcome Rachel. Hi everybody, um, this is me, this is my home office, but tonight I'm going to share you some uh, PowerPoint slides, so I'm going to disappear now and hopefully you'll be able to see my screen. All right, so hopefully you can see uh, my slides now. So thanks Joel for introducing me. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about man's best friend and how they can help us cure cancer. So who am I? Well, firstly, I'm a veterinarian. Um, I teach out at the Gatton campus and I have the great privilege of teaching uh, veterinary science and veterinary technical students as well as science students. Um, and that's a lot of fun going out and um, teaching all those young people. And as Joel said, I'm a pathologist. So what are pathologists? Uh, pathologists study disease. Mostly we act to diagnose disease. That means we look at its appearance or morphology and we figure out what it is. We also predict what it's going to do, which is something called prognosis. As a major part of our work, we also figure out how disease behaves 
what drives a disease process, and this is called pathogenesis. Um, most of you probably wouldn't realize that veterinary pathologists like myself also help test and develop most of the treatments that are used in people. And this is done through preclinical trial work. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you about cancer and how the body and the cancer interact and how we can try and design new treatments. And that's part of the research work that I do. So I have two major research focuses. One is developing uh, treatments for dogs that have cancer. And the other is looking at the major causes of death and decline in our Southeast Queensland koala populations here around Brisbane, the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast. So firstly, what is cancer? Cancer touches many of our lives. Most of us know friends or family that have had cancer. Some of you may have even had pets that have suffered from cancer. But what a lot of people don't realize is that cancer is actually a genetic disease. It's caused by mutations in the DNA of the cancer cells that allow the cells to start to divide in an uncontrolled fashion. There are two types of gene families that cause cancer. And we can think of cancer as like a, a car that's out of control. It's accelerating out of control. The first type of genes that mutate and cause our car to go out of control are called oncogenes. They are like the accelerator being pl pressed flat to the floor. Okay, they allow cells to divide and divide out of control. But in our cancer car, the brakes have also failed as well. And these brakes are called tumor suppressor genes. The combined combination of the tumor suppressor genes and the oncogenes malfunctioning creates a snowball effect. And it's like a snowball rolling down the hill getting larger and nastier as more and more genetic mutations accumulate within those cancer cells over time. The end result is a big ball of woolly cells that steal space and nutrients from the normal tissues in our body. They invade the normal body cells that are next to them and they also spread throughout the body to organs like the liver and the lungs and this process is called metastasis. So why haven't we cured cancer? Well, one of the things that people also misunderstand about cancer is we call it one disease, but it really isn't. Even within a single individual animal or person that has cancer, that cancer will have lots and lots of different types of nasty bully cells with different bad genes. And we can see that in this little graphic that I've got in the top corner, where our ball of cancer cells, there are all sorts of different colors. And that's representing all the different types of bad genes that those cancer cells might have. So if you're an individual with cancer, not all of those cancer cells within you will be the same. And then if we look at a population of people that have cancer, they will have lots of different types of mutations in their genes and different bully cells, even if we have named that cancer the same thing, like breast cancer or prostate cancer. So this variation in the badness and the gene mutations means that not all cancer cells will die when we treat them. So because of this, it's called tumor heterogeneity, this difference in the types of the bad DNA and in the bully cells in our out of control car, we often need to use multiple different types of treatments to target different weaknesses that each of those different types of bully cells have to try and get rid of that cancer or keep it under control. So traditionally oncologists, which are the doctors that treat cancer, use three major things, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, or as they call it, the slash, the burn, and the poison. And it will depend on the type of cancer, which one is most appropriate and what combinations your doctor will select if you have cancer to try and get rid of it. But what happens if you throw all three of those treatments at it is that you'll probably kill off a majority of the cells, but because the cells are so abnormal and so crazy with their DNA, 
there's this risk that maybe even one or two of them might survive. So what you'll see when we treat cancer is most of the tumor will go away and we call that remission of the patient, the tumor will shrink down. But if there's an unfortunate event where one of the bully cells survives, it can regrow the cancer and the patient will come out of remission. So what I do is I develop the fourth type of arm of treatment for cancer and that's immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is designed to wake up the body's immune system to recognize and attack those cancer cells. So our goal is to wake up the immune system, control or prevent or destroy that tumor and protect the body against its spreading. And in my research, I use germs or sort of bacterial products or plant products to help kickstart the immune system in the hope that it will go on and fight the cancer. And these germs and plant products provide what we call a danger signal and more about that later. So is there any evidence that injecting bacterial preparations into or near tumors would work? Well, actually there is, and the science is really, really old. And it's a very, very fascinating story. Back more than a hundred years ago, a New York surgeon called William Coley noticed that some patients when they got infections or fevers would have their cancers disappear. This was before antibiotics and before we understood a lot about bacteria and microbes and infectious diseases. So Coley, having observed this uh, phenomenon by where people who had infections would lose their cancers, started to do some pretty crazy things like injecting people with live bacteria. And because of that, not a great idea, some of them died, but it did actually work. Some of them were cured of their cancer. And through his scientific career, he eventually realized that he could use dead bacteria, which were a lot safer, in various combinations, and that would cause prolonged remissions or cures in quite a high percentage of his patients. And at the time, there was no radiotherapy or chemotherapy. There was really only surgery to treat um, cancers. So this was quite revolutionary. And it was called Coley's Toxins Therapy. Now, Coley used to try and cause a deliberate fever in his patients, so they would get quite sick. So they did have some side effects, but it did work quite well. So how can dogs help us cure cancer? Well, most people don't realize it, but pet dogs get a lot of cancer. In fact, about one in three dogs will get cancer in their lifetimes and quite a few of them will unfortunately succumb to it. And because pet dogs naturally develop these tumors in the same way the bully cancer cells interact with their bodies, the normal tissue, the blood vessels, the immune system of the dogs, the dog cancer is actually really similar to human cancers. Also, the types of cancers that dogs get are very similar to people as well. So they get melanoma, lymphoma, sarcomas, carcinomas. In fact, for most human cancers, there is a dog counterpart. And some dog cancers are even more common than the human version. And that means we can readily study that cancer in dogs and they act as what scientists call a model uh, of system or a way of studying that disease. There's this particularly nasty, highly aggressive bone tumor called osteosarcoma. And unfortunately, it strikes down children and teenagers. And it's also really, really common in large breeds of dogs like Great Danes and Rottweilers. And so we can use those large breed dogs to study osteosarcoma and hopefully develop not only treatments for the dogs, but treatments for the people. So traditional cancer treatment uses laboratory animals like rats and mice. Uh, these animals have their cancers artificially created. So generally that's either having a mouse cell or a human cell injected into them to form the tumor, or they may have a natural or a genetically engineered DNA defect, because remember cancer is a genetic disease. That means they develop their cancers at an early age. Scientists have developed a lot of treatments that can cure rats and mice of cancer, but when we put these treatments into our human patients, they often fail. And one of the reasons for this is that those rat and mouse cancers don't really interact with the surrounding body 
like a natural cancer does, especially the immune system, the blood vessels, the other tissues. It's, it's a more artificial model, as we would say, of the cancer. Now, rats and mice have taught us a great many things about cancer and other diseases, and they've really helped us out in learning how to find cures for many things. But for cancer, perhaps there is a better way. And because pet dogs get the same cancers as us, they can serve as these models for developing treatments or allowing us to understand the disease better. The study of a disease in one species to help another is called comparative medicine. And progressing research from the lab to a useful treatment or test is called translational medicine. So dogs are not only our best friends as companions, but they're also our best friends potentially for comparative and translational medicine in cancer. So dogs have uh, a number of different advantages. The first one being that it's quite ethical to experiment on dogs because in my research particularly, the pet dogs that we recruit for our trials, they often have no hope for a cure their owners either can't afford the uh, very expensive cancer treatments or the dogs have tried the cancer treatments and they failed, um, or the owners are really interested in helping out research. So what we're doing in working with the dogs is we're trying to create a treatment for that dog and help it and its family. So we find that the ethics of that research is a very strong thing. The cancer biology in dogs is also very similar to people. The tumors look the same, they behave the same, they can have the same genetic defects and the cancers often run quite strongly in particular breeds of dog. And as a pathologist, I see that all the time. There's certain breeds that will come in and you'll know they'll have a certain type of cancer. And that makes it easy for us to identify those particular animals as targets and then recruit them into the trials. Um, and then the other thing about dogs is unfortunately, and we all know this if we've got dogs and we've loved them is they just don't last as long as us, right? So um, they age faster and that means their disease progression for the cancer is a lot faster. So we can get results in the cancer trials much more fast than we would if we were experimenting on other models. And basically the dogs are living with us, they're sharing our homes. And so all of those things that interact with our bodies, are interacting with the dogs, and they're creating a lot of similarity between us and the dogs. So I'd like to show you now some of my research and the dogs that we've worked with. So the first um, model that I have here, it's got quite a mouthful of a name, it's called the intratumoral adjuvant model with complete groins adjuvant. Now an adjuvant is a type of molecule that boosts the immune system and creates a powerful immune response. So we use adjuvants in vaccines. Um, there's adjuvants in the flu vaccine or the vaccines that children get. And we can use them in this case um, to help us try and treat cancer. So complete Freund's adjuvant is a particularly powerful and quite old adjuvant. It's been around since the 1950s and it's basically bacterial products ground up in oil. And here you can see on the lovely photo, Jackson the Roddy um, and Henry the, the Shorthead Pointer uh, with one of my wonderful research volunteer students who's now a vet out working in practice. And they had some particularly nasty cancers. So on this slide here, and I'm sorry it's a little busy, but in the first panel, we can see um, the animals. And so this is Jackson's nose. That's the really, really nasty cancer that he had. He was only given about eight to 12 weeks to live with that cancer and there was no surgery that could be done uh, because he couldn't really chop his nose off and it would be terrible. Um, and he'd also tried all the chemotherapy and that hadn't worked either. Henry had, uh, it's quite a small tumor when we, got, we eventually got to see him, but he'd had two whole surgeries trying to cut that cancer out and it just kept coming back. Uh, and it was on the, his back leg there and you can see the big scars that he's got on his fur coat um, where he's had the big surgeries trying to remove that tumor and the surgery has failed. And this is the paw from a little dog called Mia and she had it on her wrist. And there was no way they could do surgery on that tumor without having to amputate her leg, which her owner didn't want. The middle panel here is um, showing us the tumor cells. And unless you're a pathologic, I look and look at that and I think, oh, isn't it wonderful? But most people would be just like, yeah, there's some dots there. 
Uh, but the cancer cells are nasty. They've destroyed the normal tissue that should be in that dog and we can't see it anymore. And here in this last lot of panels is the immune cells that are left after they've killed the tumor cells. The tumor cells have completely gone from these three dogs and uh, all we have left are the immune cells that have come in to fight them off after the adjuvant's been injected. So um, Jackson ended up um, surviving for at least a year. Remember, he was only given eight to 12 weeks to live. Henry was given eight weeks to live and he survived for 17 months. Uh, and Mia, um, unfortunately, she did die from another cancer after about eight months, but we were able to keep um, this tumor that we have treated away. So we considered that a really good result. Another um, model that we do is creating vaccines for cancers. And what we do for this model is we take a little piece of the tumor, we grind it up with our bacterial products and adjuvants to trigger that danger signal that wakes the body up and makes it realize that the cancer cells are bad. Then we um, inject it back into the dog's back leg or the behind their neck, just like a puppy vaccination. So this isn't real cancer cells, it's actually just ground up dead bits of cancer cells that go back in. And we give them a series of shots over uh, a few weeks and then monthly, and we see what happens. So here's a couple of uh, dogs that have responded really well to this vaccination therapy. The first one is Gus. So Gus had this lump on the back of his paw and again, his owner didn't want any surgery done because that would mean he'd um, end up having to have an amputation and she doesn't want a tripod dog and it wouldn't have been any good for Gus. And uh, in his particular tumor, we can use this what's called a special stain and it's, it lights up the tumor cells in this bright purple color. So here before Gus has had his needles, we can see the tumor cells as purple. And then as he goes through and has a varying uh, number of the treatments, the injections over time, the tumor cells go away and we end up with just a few little purple cells. They're probably just the remnant normal cells in that area. And unfortunately, he runs out of the vaccine and the tumor cells come back. But for us, this was a really interesting result because it proved that we could keep the tumors away as long as we were able to give the dogs the vaccines. And this is the lovely Roddy called Griffin. He's like what we call our poster dog. So Griffin had a really, really nasty cancer. It's called cutaneous non-epitheliotropic T-cell lymphoma, but it's basically a cancer of his immune cells in his skin. And he was given only about three months to live even if he had chemotherapy, but his owners had a little baby. And if you have a dog and you give it chemo, it's going to excrete um, toxic chemicals in its pee and its poo. So they, they didn't want it, that to happen and they were just heartbroken. Um, so they came to us for our trial and we made the vaccine for Griffin. This is the panel showing that the dark blue cells here are all the cancer in his skin. And then after he has his series of vaccinations, the cancer just goes away and it stays away. He had tumors all over his chest, all over the side of his um, uh, chest and the front of his chest. Uh, the surgeons had tried to remove it and cut it out, but it hadn't worked. Um, and then we did the immunotherapy and he's now two, two years, more than two years after he's had his treatment and he's still disease free. So we're really, really excited about that. So this just shows us that dogs, they can be more than our companions. They can be our best friends in science as well. And we can use our pet dogs to determine if treatments are safe and if they work, which is efficacy. And we've gone on to trial um, these therapies in a, a small number of patients. So there's a trial down in Canberra for the complete friends adjuvant. And there's been, uh, there hopefully will be some trials on the autologous vaccine as well starting soon. Um, but it's, it's in a really exciting science and I'm uh, thankful that you've joined us tonight for a bit of Monday Night Science. And with that, I'm very happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation and a wonderful dive into a world that I didn't know anything about. Um, so we are now open for questions. So if you have a question, you can pop down to that Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, type it in there, and I see a couple of questions have started coming through already throughout the talk. Um, 
after this talk, do stick around because we are going to just have a very quick poll just to, to gauge your feedback on how this went. Um, so I am going to, um, we're not going to talk about what happens next month um, with Riz Science. We'll, we'll hold that thought for now. Um, so I have a question here from um, one member is, I understand that pigs have a similar physiology to humans. Can they be a useful model too? Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at any species, it just depends what you want to study and how uh, much you want to manipulate that animal or how much you want a natural thing to, to happen in that animal. So one of the things pigs are used a lot for is transplantation research of the lungs and the heart particularly, as well as heart surgery because pigs can be quite a bit different from us, but their hearts and their lungs are about the same size. So often doctors that work in the very, very high tech field of transplantation surgery will use pigs. Great. Um, I have a couple of questions here around a similar theme. One is, has our selective breeding of dogs contributed to their cancer risk? And another here from Scott is, are there breeds that are low risk to cancer or cancer risk free? Those are really great questions, guys, because one of the things I didn't want to take too much time and get into, but um, you know, we're talking about genetics. And if you've got a purebred dog, the dogs in that breed share a lot more of the same genes than they would compared to another breed or a mutt. So yes, absolutely. Um, some, in some breeds, we've figured out the genes that have malfunctioned. So if you look at uh, staffies, everybody loves a staffy, right? Or boxes, they have a, a mutated gene called CKIT and it gives them the mast cell tumors that I showed a lot of you tonight, okay? So you're, if you get a staffy or a boxer, they're much higher risk of having a mast cell tumor, which is a skin tumor, than another breed of dog. But interestingly, the golden retrievers in the United States have the same problem, but our golden retrievers here don't. And that's because the genotypes, so ge the genetic relatedness of the golden retrievers in the US is different to the ones that are in Australia. So if you wanna look for a healthy breed of dog, and I could get on a serious soapbox about this as a pathologist because all I see is diseased dogs all day. Healthiest dogs tend to be mutts, your average RSPCA shelter mutt, or greyhounds. I've got a greyhound. I adopted a greyhound. I love him. He is the most bomb-proof, gentle dog we have ever had. He's just the sweetest. So greyhounds are great, but they're big. They're really big. They're not apartment dogs. Uh, and they're not very active, surprisingly. He just lies around all the time. But if, if you want to look at a healthy dog, um, your mutt dog, or a greyhound would be a great way to go. And then the other ones are the working breeds, uh, Kelpies, uh, cattle dogs, but those are dogs that have some real psychological needs. They need to be kept entertained. They need a job. They're dogs that need jobs. So you don't want to have a dog like that unless you're going to exercise it or take it to agility when we're not in a COVID situation or something or train it or do obedience with it. So, but there's always a right dog for somebody out there. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a question here. Are there other diseases that dogs are good human models for? I think they mean, um, mean good models for human diseases. Yes, yes. So, I mean, my, my focus tends to be on, on cancer. So that's what I, I think a lot about a lot. Um, dogs are also fairly similar to us in terms of, of their heart and lungs. So they are used a lot for the cardiovascular research studies. Um, but a lot of animals don't quite get all the heart attacks and stuff that, that we do. Dogs really, they are far and away, sadly, the species that gets the most types of cancer. So that naturally, like you don't see as much, cats, cats can get cancer, horses can get cancer, but it's just not very common in them. So um, really that's what, what I focus on. And, and even things like brain cancer, which is a really rare but devastating disease in people and dogs, they, they get the same. So we use dogs a lot for oncology models or cancer models. Fantastic. Well, we're almost out of time. So I just have one more question to ask, which is, what is your dog's name? Barney. 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 And he came with that name and that's what he is. But he goes by Barnabas, Barnacle, um, you know, 
we change it. Just, we change it up a bit, but yeah, he's fine. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, there are a couple more questions, but apologies, we uh, didn't get time to look at those, but I'm sure that um, there'll be future opportunities. We'd love to have Rachel back in person at Riz Science in the future, maybe talk about the next update of your work. And I'm sure there'll be lots more chance to chat with you then. All right, thank um, you everyone, yeah. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming online tonight and um, making this such a successful event from our end. Um, I'm seeing lots of compliments coming through here, um, thanking Rachel for sharing. Greetings from New Zealand. That's fantastic. Um, so <laughs> we definitely love this again. We do have a quick poll that we're going to pop up at this point. Uh, let's see if we can do that. asking the big questions here. Oh. Ooh. Less people than I thought. <laughs> what's the, um, Rachel, do you know what the, what's the portion of the population who has dogs? Oh, I don't know, but there's 4 million dogs in Australia. It's just that some of us have more than one. So, <laughs> yeah, I know and that. What, like uh, seven or eight million households. So you know, maybe a third of households with a dog. So you could actually, maybe it's not far off the mark. Mm. Very interesting, great. Oh, we have 100% voting. It's better than my students at uni guys, well done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on, someone's just devoted themselves. Oh. <laughs> Back to 100%. Um, well, that's, a, that's some great, Great statistics for us. That is, so their numbers are that 27% of viewers here have a dog and 80% do not. The, the math seems a little weird to me there. I think there was a few people joining perhaps or rejoining at the end. So, you know, we've got some rounding errors. That's great. So about, about a quarter um, people with dogs. Love it. Um, so look, if you do have any feedback on um, the session today, we would love to hear from you. Hit us up on Twitter or on our Facebook page. Don't forget to be able to catch this video on YouTube. And please join me once again in thanking Rachel for our very first Briz Science at Home presentation. That was fantastic. And um, thank you so much tonight, Rachel. It was really interesting. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night all. We'll see you again soon.